It's a special privilege to welcome Senator Norm Atkins, who's here, um, a longtime friend, very, very good friend of Dalton Camp. Uh, this award was inspired, really, by Dalton's contribution to democracy and to, to um, the articulate expression of democracy, especially through the media. And many of you who are old enough will remember the political forum on Morningside that Peter Zowski used to host every week for years and years, and Dalton was an indispensable representative of not only the regions of Canada, if you will, but of um, clear-headed, reasonable, good sense thinking about Canada and nationhood and Canadian politics. So it's really our privilege to carry on this tradition in his name. Um, we um, are um, very inspired by the number of submissions we get every year in Dalton Camp's name. And um, this year, well over 100 submissions came forward, so it was very, very competitive. And I think, and we like to think, Dalton certainly is, uh, if, if, if there is another world, Dalton's smiling in it, winking in it right now, quite amused that we would be carrying on in this tradition. I think he would be rather pleased. Uh, Norm Atkins, as I said, is an old, was an old friend of, of Dalton, I'm sure remembers him fondly, spent a, a career in advertising, and of course is now a senator. And so it's a great pleasure to welcome Senator Atkins here to say a few words on behalf of Dalton Camp and the award. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, honored to be here uh, this evening to take part in this important award ceremony. I would like to uh, congratulate the organizers of this event for their efforts, as well as the jury for their role in judging the uh, continuation of the competition. And, uh, and most important, I want to congratulate the winners of the Dalton Camp Award. I will begin my comments with a direct quote about Dalton Kingsley Camp from the website of the Friends of Canadian Broadcasting, with which I absolutely agree. I quote, he had a great respect for the merit of diverging opinions and an in insoluble appetite for independence of thought, freedom of expression, and the free flow of ideas." End of quote. Next to my father, Dalton Camp was the biggest influence in my life. He taught me from the early age of 11, to reach beyond what I thought I was capable and uh, could achieve. He was my hero, my mentor, my brother-in-law, <laughs> and most importantly, my friend. We were uh, also business associates and uh, ultimately, I was a business partner. Dalton was successful in most anything he touched. He had a very successful career in advertising, which he started in 1949, and worked up to developing and owning his own company, Dalton K. Camp and Associates, in 1959. In fact, he gave me my start in business, and, and because he was politically active, he introduced me to politics at the age of 18. I started as a gopher in New Brunswick, provincial elections in 1952, 
and I was involved in many subsequent campaigns with him. At one time, I was his executive assistant when he was national president of the Progressive Conservative Party from 1964 to 1969. And those were, as some of you will recall, turbulent years. To be with Dalton and be exposed to him was like studying for a master's degree in political science. I was going to say doctorate, but I was afraid to. It was, it was truly awe-inspiring and educational. Dalton had a brilliant mind and was a keen observer of the political life of this country. He had the courage to say what he believed to be right. He loved the challenge of politics and the ideas of the people. He had a remarkable ability to be both a political philosopher and a political activist. His encouragement and passion for people, for ideas, and for Canada were a constant. It goes without saying that he loved writing. His work over the years reflects how keenly he observed and how much he cared about polit polit political life and this country. He exercised his political voice through his unique ability with the pen, or should I say his typewriter, not to mention the fact that he was, as the chair mentioned, uh, on radio in the 80s with Eric Kierens and Stephen Lewis. And uh, in addition, he spent many hours uh, on television as, as guests and as a commentator. He used to sit on a chair with his feet up with a portable typewriter perched on his lap. And he utilized the two-finger method to type. Some of you will find that immensely amusing because of computers, but it was his tool of trade, if you will. In fact, when he passed away, we found numerous different typewriters stashed away in various places, <laughs> including uh, one in my office. <laughs> I remember when he was around and preparing his column, I would ask, what are you writing about today? He would reply, I don't know. <laughs> I think in more cases than not, he did know but wouldn't say in case he changed his mind. And he used to tuck himself away when he was writing his column, and nobody bothered him until he was through. However, he would often give me the copy to read when he was finished. It was always typed, but so marked up that I don't know how the newspaper editors figured out his his sentences from the scribbles due to his editing. Fortunately, I was used to reading his copy, but I found that a little, it was a little ironic and amusing, given that he was a perfectionist with his writing, that he had these scribbles. I recall when his column appeared that his followers would avidly pursue his work to discover what new and obscure word he had included to challenge them with the English language because he had such a command of it. Don described himself in the following way, and I quote, a deep believer in party politics and a romantic admirer of those ordinary and sensible people who maintain and assured the vitality of partisanship, end of quote. 
Dalton believed that if you engaged in politics, you can con contribute to the development of the country. I think he wrote with that in mind, and I think he understood that he had an obligation to speak out on issues important to Canada and to Canadians. He was a wonderful writer and an author who often used metaphors and analogies to maximize his message. He rarely spoke about the same issue more than, more than one time, unless it was a, a, an issue that he felt was critically important to the interests of the country. It is a pity, uh, his analysis was never a contradiction and he was progressive in his thinking as he was in his politics. I am often approached by people who say that they still miss his columns. I want to share with you something that Dalton wrote and I quote, it is a pity that so few journalists understand the requirement for partisan politics and his role in a democracy. But it is difficult to educate or enlighten people who do not. As we used to say in Carleton County, know their arse from their elbow about politics, but who delight in disparaging its practices and deframing its pra practitioners, end of quote. I am afraid, I am afraid on some occasions, not much has changed. I believe Dalton wrote with that philosophy in mind, so he was the voice for many who could not be heard. He was the conscience for those he thought were not mindful of Canadians and their needs. He used the wonderful writing skill to impart his particular brand of politics and his political thinking through the media. His goal was to influence uh, public opinion and stimulate the thoughts of Canadians on each and every issue he thought important. Dalton was not an, only a talented and exceptional writer. He was an outstanding strategist. The most certainly is a role model for any you who are in the journalistic path he took. He left a huge mark on the political, economic, and social life of this great country. To all of you aspiring writers, I wish you all the wisdom and success as that of the Dalton K. Camp. Thank you. Our distinguished jury includes Jim Bird, over here, chair of the uh, of the committee, Jim. Many of you might know, uh, filmmaker, producer, former vice president of the CBC before Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, I might add. <laughs> um, Pauline Couture, writer, uh, woman of many, many, many talents, um, producer, broadcaster. Uh, the list is way too long. Uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, offer here. And Maggie Siggins, the light is there, oh, there it is in my face. Maggie Siggins, uh, Governor General Award winning writer, author, prolific writer at that. So a very distinguished panel. And I'm gonna ask Jim to come up and hand out the awards and announce the winners. Thank you, Noreen. Uh, just a quick word about the process we go through. I'll just take 30 seconds. When the essays are received, they're first checked for technical uh, 
matters by the friends before the jury sees them. And then the jury receives the essays divided into three piles, and from that we each pick a handful that we think are worthy of further consideration. We then read all of those essays together and uh, then have uh, a meeting in which we try to reach a consensus. So far, in all the years, we haven't had a problem doing that, so, and we're delighted to say we didn't this year. Although it was a tough year, there were some very excellent essays this year. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Pauline and to Maggie for their help again this year. Uh, it's been terrific. And on to the essays. Uh, our first essay, while rooted in the Mahar Arar case, is, is really an essay that links a truly democratic society to its media and in particular to the journalism practiced in that media. Uh, it's, uh, it talks about a journalism that's rooted in being skeptical, cynical, critical, and thorough. Uh, I like the way our, put, our winner put it in one section in the essay. She said, if you're a journalist and somebody tells you your mother loves you, double check it before you print it. Uh, and I, I think that captured the essay of her, the, the earth of her essay. For her essay, Canadian media, government watchdog or lapdog, please welcome Miriam Abdullah Shabani. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have to admit I was somewhat disappointed to hear that the uh, award ceremony would be here in Ottawa, where I was born and raised, and here at Carleton, where I spent the uh, greater part of the last four years. Um, so there would be no you know, all-expenses-paid trip to uh, BC for me. But um, now that I'm here, um, I realize that I'm actually quite lucky to be here tonight um, to receive this award here uh, in the presence of my professors who have supported me, and I do have to mention Professor Amy Bartholomew, who I would say helped me discover myself um, in the company of my family, um, and I have to single out the most important person in this room, my mother, uh, who always believes in me before I believe in myself. So thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, as um, uh, Mr. Bird mentioned, the title of my essay is Canadian Media, Government Watchdog or Lapdog. Um, in it, I discuss the complicity of the Canadian media in Meharar's ordeal and the impact of, these failings, of their failings on the health of our democracy. Over the span of several years, while Arar was still detained in Syria and after his return to Canada, the media routinely printed and broadcast confidential information leaked from anonymous public officials. These leaks were strategically timed to smear Arar, undermine his reputation, and fend off demands for public inquiry into his case. My objective in writing this essay was to shed light on the mistakes that were made in the media's coverage, and on the negative impacts that this had on his case, and also the integrity of our media and democratic institutions. Also, I wanted to underscore the fact that the lessons that the media should have learned from this case have not yet been grasped. Rather, the media has since continued to report highly prejudicial fragments of classified information in other national security investigations, such as that, such as that of Abdul al-Malki, Adil Sharkawi, and most recently, Abu Sufyan Abdul Razik. And finally, I'll just share a short expert, uh, excerpt from my essay in the hopes of getting you all interested to read it. Um, while the press has intensely criticized the government We put our trust in what we assume to be a competent and unbiased press for our knowledge and understanding of current events and to inform us of our government's actions, plans, and mistakes. Democracy involves more than elected officials. It depends crucially on a vibrant public sphere in which public opinion can be formed on the basis of debate and deliberation by a critical and informed citizenry. This requires that information received from the media be as complete and as accurate as possible if concerned citizens are to hold public officials, elected and otherwise, accountable. For these reasons, a vigilant and independent media is necessary to serve as the government's watchdog, not its obsequious lapdog. Sadly, 
by recurrently printing and broadcasting untested information provi provided by officials who always spoke on condition of anonymity. The media resembled the latter more than the former in their coverage of Meher Arar's troubling story. The Canadian media stand to learn from this experience in order to ensure that more innocent lives are not destroyed and that dem genuine democracy is kept within the possibilities of our day. Thank you. Our second winning essay is a future-looking essay that links the revolution underway in our communication system towards a freer media where, where all of us are no longer just passive readers or listeners or viewers, but are active participants in an ongoing democratic dialogue. For her essay, Remixing Democratic Discourse, New Media and the End of Read Only, please welcome Heather Stilwell. much everyone for being here. I'd like to thank the uh, Friends of Canadian Broadcasting as well. I'd like to congratulate Miriam on her achievement as well. I'll say a quick few words about my paper, which as you know intends to draw a link between media and democracy in Canada. It's certainly the case that even within our de democratic society, much of the information that is available to us is controlled. Whether it is due to the shrinking number of companies that control our media, or to the expanding intellectual property laws that guard our creations. As such, we can't ignore the opportunities that are emerging from within the online medium to connect and engage citizens in shaping and transformation our information and culture. There are certainly those who wish to resist these changes that online and digital technology will bring. Those who refer only to the dangers, the pirates, and the amateurs. But there are also those who refuse to ignore the opportunities of the strikingly open medium and those who aim to strike a balance where we can take what we've learned from the past and move towards the future. It is my hope that my paper will help to shed some light on the ideas that may help us to harness this new, this new democratic opportunity for our culture. I'll read a short excerpt. We are no doubt still in the midst of an exciting revolution in the way our communication system is shaped. However, what is most promising about the present state of affairs is that we, now more than ever, have a powerful medium to give more citizens a voice within that system. One in which we need not speak apocalyptically of the death of traditional media, but where we look instead towards the future of a new, freer media. Thank you. He wasn't lying, this is very heavy. Thank you, Jim, and congratulations to the winners. Thank you, jury. Thank you, Dale, again, to the CCA for helping us share in your program. And uh, next year, Concordia, Montreal, another year, eighth year for the Dalton Camp. <laughs>